Welcome back, everyone. Thanks for joining. Today on The Joseph Carlson Show, we have a very important subject to go over, and that is the subject of making money. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Joseph, this is discussed all the time on financial YouTube. How to make money is one of the most popular topics in investing culture. In fact, that's basically all investors talk about is how to make money. For instance, a quick YouTube search of the next stock brings up these results. The top six stocks to buy in August of 2021. These five stocks could be the next Apple. That sounds exciting. Should you buy Nvidia stock now? Why the market is falling? The 10 best stocks to own for life. The top five stocks to buy for August 2021. My next big stock is so on and so forth. These videos are every single day. Every single day, there's more and more YouTubers talking about the next big stock. In fact, there's hundreds of them every single day. There's thousands of them in existence. We discuss with each other all the time how to make money in the stock market. But possibly the best way to ensure that you make money in the stock market is to ensure that you don't lose money in the stock market. Charlie Munger once famously said, all I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I'll never go there. Now, this is a bit of a funny joke. He's saying that if he knew where he was going to die, he could avoid visiting that place so he would never die. But when Charlie Munger said this, he really wasn't trying to talk about death. He was trying to teach us something about the stock market and about investing in general. If we knew ahead of time what we were going to do that was going to lose us money, we could avoid doing that in the first place. And therefore, we would have more money because we wouldn't be losing money. And Charlie Munger has been incredibly good at not losing money. So in this episode, I'm going to highlight, I believe, the three major ways that investors are losing devastating amounts of money. We're going to go over all three of them. I'm going to give examples of each, and we're going to learn how to avoid them. In number one, we have scams. Anywhere where there is money, there's going to be someone that tries to steal it. That is just a certainty. If you have money anywhere, there will be somebody that will try to get your money from you. And the majority of ways they do this is through scams. Scams have always been a financial hurdle that we face. One of the most popular scams is through phishing emails, emails that trick people into sending money the wrong way. Here's an article that says, the UC San Diego nurse and chef lose $774,631 in an escrow scam. The American dream turns into a nightmare for a young San Diego couple. Good evening, I'm Marcella Lee. I'm Carlo Chicato. After scraping together nearly $800,000 in life savings, Kevin and Nicole Knorr were prepared to put it down on a dream house in Carlsbad, only to fall victim to a sophisticated wire transfer scam. He calls it a sophisticated wire transfer scam, but really what this is, is an email scam. They said that they received an authentic appearing email with detailed instructions to wire their funds into escrow. Quote, it all matched up with everything we had received. So we proceeded with everything, Nicole said. They transferred the money as instructed, $774,631. That was their total life savings to buy this house in California. They say it wasn't until days later they realized something was terribly wrong. When they reached out to the escrow company to ask about a slight discrepancy in the numbers. Quote, And then they kind of realized, hey, wait a minute, you wired money? When did you wire it? The couple quickly contacted the FBI, which they say has been able to track the nearly $800,000 from California to Texas and now to Singapore. They said that most likely it's just been dispersed. It is gone. It is untraceable. This San Diego nurse and chef is one of the many phishing email scams. The email looked legitimate. It looked like it was from the correct company. It really was not. It was really from a scammer instructing them to send the money to the wrong place. And this happens all the time. It's a billion dollar industry. The Wall Street Journal shared another story of a similar victim. This is a businessman where his email was hacked and an email from his address was sent to his secretary telling her to wire transfer $450,000 to a scammer. And she followed the instructions because she thought it was coming from him. They had his email address. So she sent $450,000 right into the scammer's pockets all because they got access to his email address. This specific type of scam, just email compromised, email phishing, wire fraud schemes, is a growing business. In fact, if you look at the revenue growth of this scam and how much scammers are collecting year over year, it looks like the revenue growth of Amazon. In 2015, it was a quarter billion, and then in 2019, it was almost two billion. 
It is going up 40 or 50% year over year. This is incredible. More and more people are getting defrauded by simple email phishing schemes than ever before. Now, scammers are creative and they're relentless. They're not only working with emails and they're not only working with wire transfers. They're increasingly starting to use social media and crypto as a way of scamming people. Here is a real comment from my previous episode. This is from Amit and he says, out of all the videos I watch on YouTube, I feel like yours is the most reliable and concise. Congrats on 300K and thank you for all your hard work. Well, that's nice of you to say, Amit. I appreciate that. The unfortunate thing is, is there's a reply to this comment that looks like me. It has my profile pic and it says by Joseph as a username. And there is a phone number there. That's not me. That's an imposter. That's someone that's pretending to be me that if you contact them, they will try to scam you through crypto. Crypto scams have exploded over the past year. The journal says that crypto fraud targets investors hoping to cash in on the Bitcoin boom. The FTC says that consumers have reported losing more than 80 million to crypto investment scams just since last October. Well, the latest data shows that that number is increasing rapidly because Bloomberg reports that crypto scammers rip off billions as pump and dump schemes go digital. The SEC chairman says that crypto is the wild west and needs stronger investor protections. Right now, there's almost no investor protections for crypto. Nothing. No fallbacks, no insurances, no protocols. If you lose money in crypto, if it's stolen, if it's scammed in any way, you are out of luck. And crypto is stolen all the time. In fact, sometimes there's so much crypto stolen, like the case of the 600 million stolen, that there's no way for them to even use that much money. So they're returning the majority of the stolen money. They simply have too much money stolen to be able to use. Now, I already showed you this graph, the one of the email scams. This is the wire transfer frauds. This is already a huge, massive problem in the US. Billions of dollars are scammed out of people's pockets every single day, but this is the newer problem crypto scams, and it is growing rapidly. In fact, it's growing much faster than wire transfer fraud. This graph in green is quarterly, not yearly. So this is the amount of increase every three months. In Q2 of 2020, it was 4.6 million. Then the next three months, 10 million. Then 29 million, then 53 million. We're seeing 50% plus growth in the amount of crypto scams every three months. One of the founders of Dogecoin, Jackson Palmer, recently said in a tweet storm, the cryptocurrency industry leverages a network of shady business connections, bot influencers, and pay-for-play media outlets to perpetuate a cult-like get-rich-quick funnel designed to extract new money from the financially desperate and naive. I think Jackson Palmer's correct. I think that this is happening over and over again. Whether it's the Stanley Nickel token or the Million token from TechLead, they all have something in common. They start off with a pump and they end in a dump. Most of these are down 80% from their all-time highs and they have no long-lasting value. Now, with all these scammers out there, all these people trying to get your money, trying to take your money, it's more important now than ever to be able to identify a scam and avoid participating in one. And I have a few pieces of advice that I think will prevent a lot of scams from taking place. One of them is to always use two-factor authentication. This is a must. If you have any type of financial account or any account that has any sensitive information on it, you need to use two-factor authentication. For your email address, use two-factor authentication. For any bank accounts, for any brokerage accounts, every single one of them, you should be using two-factor authentication. This is a must. It can be a nuisance, but it can save you a lot more headache down the road. If you're not familiar with what two-factor authentication is, just type in two-factor authentication into YouTube, and there's plenty of tutorials explaining how to set that up. The next is to never give money or login information without extra verification. Never do it because a bank called you and they need you to verify your password. Never do it because someone emailed you and they need you to wire transfer money. Never give out your login information. Never send money without extra verification. Now, the third piece of advice is to avoid long shots. This is something that Peter Lynch has advised over and over again, to avoid long shots. Rarely do they ever work out, and in many cases, they're scams. These are companies that have no revenue, like Nikola. They prove to be scams over time. These are cryptocurrencies made by influencers, a cheap way to try to get rich very quickly. In most cases, these are scams. Scammers in many cases rely on greed. They rely on your urge to make quick money in order to lure you into making stupid decisions that ultimately will lose you a lot of money. Don't be greedy. Don't try to get rich quick. 
Don't fall into the lure of things going to the moon right away. Avoid those long shots. Avoid those people. They're not going to make you rich quick. They're going to take your money. So when I'm investing and building my wealth, I want to do it on a platform that I know is safe, that I know I'm not going to fall victim to a scammer. That's why I choose to invest my money with M1 Finance. It's an established brokerage. And I think you would have the same safety protocols with any of the brokerages like Fidelity, Schwab, or Vanguard. All of them have anti-fraud protocols. They have settlement periods, waiting times. They have two-factor authentication and they have insurance. So even if a scammer got through all these protocols, which is incredibly unlikely, at the end of the day, your money would still be insured. Now, moving on from scams, the number two way that I see investors losing devastating amounts of money is through the use of leverage. You can call it leverage, you can call it margin, or you can call it debt. It's all the same thing. Like the two-edged sword that it is, leverage can either lead to superior gains or dramatic losses. And possibly the best example in the world of how quickly leverage can lead to losses is Bill Huang. Bill Huang lost more money more quickly than any individual ever has throughout history. And he did it using leverage. This whole situation to me is like a string of, are you effing kidding me? How could that many prime brokers be so dumb as to lever up one guy all on the same stocks? It really is every bank for themselves at this point. It was this one family office that caused so much mayhem. It was Bill Huang's personal fortune, which he had built into a firm that was pretty sizable in the market. One way to measure this fiasco is by adding up Bill Huang's losses, $20 billion, to the $10 billion that the banks have lost. In total, you've got $30 billion wiped out in the space of a week. Investors on Wall Street lose money all the time. But Archegos is almost unique in financial history because of the size of the positions that a single individual accumulated and the speed with which it unraveled. This is one of the most spectacular failures in modern financial history. No individual has lost so much money so quickly. To lose $20 billion in two days, all your invested capital is difficult to do without using leverage. And in this case, well, Bill used a lot of leverage. The stock that Bill Huang lost all of his money on was Viacom CBS, the owner of the streaming service Paramount Plus. You can see the rapid increase in stock price and then the dramatic fall. This is actually a company that I own stock in. I had it in my growth portfolio for my secondary channel called Joseph Carlson After Hours. On February 9th, I bought around 19 shares of Viacom CBS for $53. So I put in $1,000, I bought a little bit of Viacom CBS, and again, the share price there was 53 bucks. So I bought into Viacom CBS right on this day, February 9th, and I watched day after day as this stock climbed higher and higher. It climbed faster than most things I've seen before. I knew that there was some enthusiasm for Discovery Plus, but I thought that this was a little bit over enthusiastic, but I continued to hold on to this position. And then on March 22nd, the stock hit over $100 a share. I was in the green by almost 100% at this point. The stock began to fall very rapidly. I've seen stocks drop pretty rapidly, but this was faster than most of them. And usually when a stock drops this fast, it's a big institutional buyer unwinding a leverage position. I put out a notice to my Discord saying that I think that there's some funny business going on. I think that there's some big positions being unwound and I'm gonna exit this position while I'm still in the green. So I sold out of this position on March 24th at $71 a share. I made roughly $350 on that trade. And then after the day I sold, the stock dropped another 35%. One day later, on March 29th, it was trading at $45 a share. Now, after this had happened, I was curious of what would cause such a dramatic rise and drop. And it turned out that my initial impression was true, that it was an institutional investor with a heavily leveraged position being unwound. On the afternoon of March 22nd, Viacom CBS announced a stock and convertible bond sale. The company wanted to raise $3 billion. Here was a stock Bill Huang was really invested in. He had a huge outsized position in it. Every time the stock moved up, he would throw more money into it and the stock would keep going up and up and up and up. Instead of helping the stock, this stock sale hurt the stock terribly. The following day, Viacom CBS went down 9%. On the Wednesday, it went down 23%. With the stock declining that far that fast, it forced a margin call. The Wall Street dealers pleaded with Bill Wong to sell some stock 
so that he would at least survive. He might take some losses. From $20 billion, he might go down to 10 or perhaps even less, but he would live to fight another day. And Bill Wong refused. Bill Hong didn't just get margin called by one bank, he got margin called by every single bank that he worked with. And when that happened at the same time, it resulted in the collapse. So with this one stock chart from Viacom CBS, it clearly illustrates the advantages and disadvantages of leverage. On one side, you can have ever increasing gains, then on the other side, you can have instant loss. Not all leverage is bad. In fact, some companies use it very intelligently. A lot of the different companies that I invest in use leverage. If I go to real estate and look at my REITs, every one of these companies uses leverage very intelligently. Store Capital uses leverage to continually buy middle market properties at attractive rates. Realty Income Corp has done this for decades, and they safely made investors lots of profit in the process. So there are smart, intelligent ways to employ leverage, but it's always with discipline and it's always with limits. I would never jeopardize my portfolio or my progress by using too much leverage and getting myself into a situation where if I was margin called, I couldn't come up with the cash. So even though I have access to a lot of capital, I could borrow a lot of money. I could borrow money against my home. I could borrow money against my brokerage. There's lots of places that I could borrow other people's money. I still choose not to do that for the most part. I like knowing that the money invested in my portfolio is my money. And if there is some type of big market sell-off, I won't be in a tough situation. Now, the next way that investors are losing a lot of money, dramatic losses, is by the improper use of concentration. Concentration is often viewed as having conviction, having know-how. If you have a concentrated portfolio, you're a serious investor. If you're diversified, then you're a dummy. You don't know what you're doing if you have any level of diversification. And some investors have gone as far as to make diversification on any level seem unwise. They take out of context some of the things that Warren Buffett has said. For instance, here's a clip of Warren Buffett talking about diversification. It's, it's a confession in our view that you don't really understand the businesses that you own. Um, you know, I base, I mean, as on a personal portfolio basis, you know, I own one stock, you know, but it's a business I know, it, and, and it leaves me very comfortable. Uh, so. Warren Buffett just said that diversification is basically an admission that you don't know what you're doing. So if you don't know what you're doing investing, you should diversify. But if you really know what you're doing, you can have single concentrated positions. But that's not exactly accurate. That's taken out of context. And that's not even how Warren Buffett himself has invested. If you look at the assets owned by Berkshire Hathaway, even though this is one corporation, it owns dozens and dozens of subsidiaries, dozens of different companies in all different sectors, from oil companies to transportation, to insurance companies, to candy companies. And on top of those subsidiaries, he has dozens of more publicly traded companies like Apple, Bank of America, and Coca-Cola. Warren Buffett is heavily diversified within his portfolio. Now you might say that Buffett is only diversified because Berkshire has grown into a very large corporation and simply because of its size, he can no longer own just one company. But even going way back to when Warren Buffett was a lot younger and his company was a lot smaller, he still talked about having some level of diversification. He never says to have all of your money concentrated into one company. First rule on investment is don't lose. And the second rule on investment is don't forget the first rule, and that's all the rules there are. I mean, that uh, if you buy things for far below what they're worth, and you buy a group of them, you basically don't lose money. If you buy things for lower than they're worth, and you buy a group of them, you basically don't lose money. Warren Buffett mentions buying a group of them. And you buy a group of them, you basically don't lose money meaning having some level of diversification. He also mentions frequently throughout his career that no matter how good of a stock picker you are, you'll never bat 100. You'll never get every single pick correct. But some investors, especially new millennials, are choosing extreme concentration over diversification, and they're putting their life savings into single positions. There's a Reddit user with the Reddit name Krud. And as it turns out, he is a 35-year-old unmarried Chicago psychiatrist who had invested and subsequently lost nearly $1 million, all of his life savings, in call options on Bill Ackman's special purpose acquisition company, the Pershing Square Tontine Holdings. This stock, the Bill Ackman SPAC, was very popular on Reddit, and many users became convinced that it had so much upside and such little downside that they could trade options on it and have no chance of losing money. So many people, like this psychiatrist, lost their entire life savings on this one stock. Now you can see how things went wrong for this psychiatrist on Reddit. 
subreddit. It says the Reddit gang had convinced himself that Ackman's Tontine was going to merge with a unicorn-like Stripe, the online payment processor. I heard rumors of this as well. It was never confirmed, but it was just one of the targets that was talked about all the time on Reddit. And they said, or Elon Musk's Starlink, these big, exciting companies. These are unicorns, but they left out that Tontine's prospectus didn't limit them to just unicorns. Ackman could pick any type of company for his target. And when the deal was finally disclosed on June 4th, Tontine's partner wasn't a unicorn. Moreover, there would be no merger. In a highly unusual move, Tontine agreed to take a 10% stake in the upcoming spinoff of Universal Music Group. And UMG is not as exciting as a payment processor like Stripe. Then there was even further problems with this deal. The structure was too complicated for both investors and their brokerages to quickly unpack, and the stock, along with the warrants and options attached to it, tanked. Within weeks, the Securities and Exchange Commission stunned Ackman, essentially killing the deal by telling the lawyers that it did not meet the New York Stock Exchange requirement for a SPAC, even though Ackman said on CNBC that the New York Stock Exchange had given him the go-ahead months earlier. By the time the deal fell apart, the psychiatrist's savings had already evaporated. He is now scrambling to make quarterly payments to the IRS while owing $350,000 in student loans. The situation he is in is now terrible, and this is a result of unnecessary concentration. He said, quote, I consider this to be a safe, calculated bet. And this publisher says so did a lot of people, including 16 others that they interviewed, that all lost a ton of money on this one holding. As hefty as the psychiatrist's losses were, they were not as disastrous as the 39-year-old software engineer who had saved $1.6 million over 20 years, ever since he began working at the age of 18. Until 2020, he had socked all of it away in a Chase savings account because he says, I didn't trust the stock market. So this individual who's 39 years old didn't invest anything. He just saved money in cash for 20 years, and he got up to the point where he had $1.6 million. But with all the excitement of the stock market in 2020, this software developer decided to transfer his $1.6 million into Robinhood, and he decided to take on concentrated positions. He said that friends were talking up Ackman's SPAC. The software engineer decided it was the only stock he would buy, sinking the entire $1.6 million into it. Quote, Ackman just sounded very confident. I trusted the guy. I thought he knew what he was doing. At first, the software engineer bought common stock, but later he says, quote, like an amateur, he transferred shares into expensive in-the-money call options with a strike price of $22, well below the $30 where the stock was trading at at the time. I thought it was safe, he said. The highest his account value ever reached was $2 million, but had those options worked out, he calculates he would have made almost $4 million. They expired worthless on July 16th, a few days before Ackman announced the SEC had torpedoed his plans. He lost 20 years of savings in a matter of weeks, having a highly concentrated position and using options. He says these days he is so depressed that he has trouble getting out of bed and his work performance is suffering. Quote, I'm not mentally there. I've got to pick myself up or this is going to ruin my life even further. This article goes on to illustrate example after example of the devastating effects of having an over-concentrated position into one company. Anything can happen with any company. No matter how much research you've done, no matter how much you know about this one company, there are factors outside of your control that can change the outcome. It's true that I have some positions larger than others. I have a big position in Apple, I have bigger positions in Microsoft, I have a pretty large position in JP Morgan, but overall, I consider my portfolio to be pretty well diversified. I would never feel really comfortable putting all of my money into one company. And I would especially never do that while trading options. It is a recipe for disaster. Investing should not be dangerous. And if it's done correctly, it's really not dangerous. With my portfolio, I'm investing using a reputable brokerage that has a lot of security protocols, a lot of insurance. I'm investing without being deterred by all the latest scams, all the latest pump and dumps, all the latest ways to get rich quick. I've avoided the since the beginning of this portfolio, I'll keep avoiding them as we go on. I'm investing in assets that have been tried and true over decades of time. Dividend paying companies that have high amounts of cash flow and good future earning potential. And I have a diversified portfolio. I'm not putting all of my money into one position and I'm not using leverage. 
So I think by avoiding these common ways of losing money, I'll make more money over the long term. I'll have better risk-adjusted returns, and I will never have a big setback like a lot of these people are having. Now that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, a thumbs up is always appreciated. And if you want to join the Patreon, there's a link in the description. You get access to a Discord community, which we have a lot of fun discussing stocks there. So other than that, invest safe, and I'll see you next time.